Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm Sarah and today I'm going to be talking with Cam who's an expert in foraging and mushrooms and we're going to discuss the Amanita muscaria mushroom or the fly agaric to look at health benefits, psychotropic effects, harvesting, preparation, safety, myths and more. So feel free to comment and I hope you enjoy the video. Bear in mind that this was a TikTok live so the, the quality isn't fantastic but all the information is there for so, you. Do, do you want to introduce um, the, the mushroom today? Uh, oh, and just so people know, TikTok get, made a massive fuss of my account trying to stop us talking about this mushroom. So people are going to be lucky to be on this live. Yeah. Well, it's always the case, isn't it? Yeah. Let's put these up. Yeah. I'll get mine here. So um, yeah. we're talking about the, um, the fly agaric today or the um amanita muscaria mushroom do you want to show everybody yours because you've um you're the expert I'm, in prepping and picking well i'm actually at home i'm not at the gym um, at the moment so i haven't got them on me okay oh so i have to hold the the prop so people can who are joining can it's, see what we're talking about this is what the image is for the <laughs> yeah but um but yeah i mean um the well, I mean, where do you want to start with this? What have you learned about the... Well, first of all, we'll start off by saying, basically, the reason why me and Sarah are doing this is because this mushroom is getting a lot of popularity at the moment. People are specifically requesting me to teach them how to um, basically use this or take this mushroom, which um, can be dangerous, but in the, the vast majority of it, if you do it correctly, is it, it, it's not dangerous as far as I'm aware, but I'm sure Sarah has got some... Um, things to put in uh, with regards to the actual biochemical side of it um but um yeah it, but we're trying to protect the mushroom basically teach people how to use this thing correctly because all it'll take is one wrong misuse of it gets in the papers and then it'll become banned because currently it's completely legal to pick and prepare this yes that, that's why i'm not sure why tiktok was so upset about me um just telling I was doing a live so, so basically I did look in the literature and there's no official reported deaths from this mushroom and I think there there's one that looks similar to this that's edible that I think people have somebody got ill because they thought they were eating the relative but you're the bushman so you would know what what do you think they ate by accident well what were they trying to eat and they picked this instead I mean as far as I'm aware I mean even if you manage to mistake um, this mushroom for the beach would sicken it wouldn't kill you mm. and the only thing that it could possibly the only thing that will really kill you if you ate it and that looks anything like a fire garrick is Amanita phylloides the death cap or Amanita verosa the destroying angel and there they look very very different but they're Maybe. white though yeah you wouldn't exactly, yeah, I, yeah. Um, so I think with the, with the biochemistry, just like the history of it, um, exactly as you said in the, we, in the last live about drinking the reindeer urine, what actually happens is that um, there are four compounds in it that are important. There's the, the muscomol, then there's the muscazone, there's muscarine, and then there's um, what, what um, people have to call it different names. Like some people call, call it um, ibogenic acid and other people call it ibogenate. What do you call it? Abdenic acid. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, the one that is the most interesting is muscomol, but the others are important too because muscarine. Um, that's how acetylcholine got discovered. So, and muscarine and acetylcholine are really similar. So that's where the smart drug properties of this mushroom would, would come in, the nootropic. And um, right. muscarine has and has been used for treating glaucoma, um, and also for clearing. Um, uh, it, obstructions in the GI tract uh, but medicinally there's obviously pharmaceuticals now but I would imagine that our ancestors would have used mushrooms like this with muscarine in them for eye problems and and, and gut issues uh, and then the muscomol is really interesting that's the one that um, I think people are going to be most interested in because it can really help with anxiety sleep because yeah. it binds to the GABA A receptors and interestingly um, the the muscomol binds in exactly the same place in the receptor as GABA itself. So it's the most natural GABA stimulator possible because benzodiazepines like Xanax and Valium and even alcohol bind in a completely different place on the GABA receptor. So they stimulate it. But literally what's in this mushroom is as good as our own GABA. Wow. And then, yes. 
And the ibogenic acid, the ibogenic acid is the opposite. So that's kind of a glutamate agonist, which again, glutamate in the right amounts can act as a smart drug or a, a sort of learning potentiating agent. But the problem is, this is where people might have got scared, is that in high doses, it's a bit like canate. So the um, ibogenic acid and canate, which comes from psychedelic seaweed, um, can be used to be neurotoxic. So what people use it for is they deliberately cause lesions in the brain by giving yeah. animals uh, or whatever, or, or even fruit flies, massive doses of um, the ibogenic acid to deliberately kill neurons so they can start to learn about neural pathways in, in the brain and that's yeah. why people are frightened because if you look it up it will tell you it's a compound that scientists can buy and it's a neurotoxin but that's in like a humongous dose uh, and, and it's, it's also the directly to the brain as well isn't it rather than being ingested mm. and going through the, the gi traps and everything yeah, but what I find interesting is, isn't it interesting that you've got a GABA um, molecule and a glutamate molecule in the mushroom? So everything, as nature intended, is all balanced out for us. It's balanced out. So this, and, this takes us on to preparation then? Yes, exactly, so it, because it, it, um, the ibogenic acid is like a pre-drug, and you can either mm -hmm. eat it and hope that your liver converts it into muscomol, but the problem is it goes straight into the bladder. So unless you want to drink your own piss then you know there there's better ways to kind of prepare it and i think the um the listeners might want to know the story about the reindeer piss and santa because these mushrooms have been around for a long time and they're not just in the uk they're in other parts of europe and siberia yeah, yeah. and there's like an interesting tradition to them yeah well the, the reindeer story basically is the native people of um, siberia they lead um, herds of reindeer around with these mushrooms because reindeer love these mushrooms but then obviously on the cold um, dark you know northern nights they used to uh, feed these mushrooms to the reindeer and they'd drink the reindeer piss and all basically just be tripping balls in, in the snow really and uh, they think that uh, a reindeer had a, a fly agaric in its mouth and that's where the legend of uh, Rudolph's red nosed reindeer came from but I do know also about drinking urine not personally, but yeah. um, shamans shamans will consume raw mushrooms and then uh, feed, uh, then give their urine to uh, the the people that are there, they're doing the the shamaning for or anything like that. Oh, no, I've heard about that. Mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. There's a book yeah. called um, Phantasmagorica, and there's a, there's very limited copies of it in the world, and it's stories about psychedelics. And there's an island where. The men and the shamans take the psychedelic plant first and piss it out and the women have it second. So, so this is all to do with our ancestors knew all about this business of a, of a pro drug. Whereas what you're going to tell us is like, how can we prepare the mushrooms so we don't have to drink our own piss and how we don't get too much um, of the ibogenic acid or the muscazone because oh I forgot there's one more compound in it called muscazone and that yeah. in high concentrations can make that causes the delirium um, but you know it, that's only if people overdose but again uh, uh, this this mushroom is a has got delirium properties but I think muscazone is much higher in the panther cap which is the brown spotty mushroom that people like to to use well, am I right in thinking as well that the ibotenic acid is converted into muscozone through exposure to the sun as well? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's UV active. There's actually people that make it in labs like that. So that that could be what we were talking when we were talking earlier today about our ancestors probably dried the mushrooms in the sun. So they may have wanted the muscozone as well because that was yeah, just well, in a high dose. Mm. Well, go, go, going on to the preparation then, because there's there's a couple of ways that I know how to prepare this, and and they all um, start with drying the mushroom at about seventy to seventy five degrees C, decarboxylating mm -hmm. it basically, and you'll be start, you could be you'll be converting some of the ibotenic acid over into the muscomol. About thirty percent conversion is is what I've read. Um, you roughly get, but then through further cooking, then when you make it into a tea, you get a further conversion, but a lot mm. of people, um, you can make it with something called a sun tea. Mm -hmm. So what you'll do is you'll dry it, uh, do the decarboxylation, convert some of the some of the ibotenic acid over to muscomol, and then mm -hmm. the remaining ibotenic acid you basically put the um, the dried uh, aminita muscaria in a jar in water, and then you leave it on a windowsill 
in direct right. sunlight. And then that starts to convert some of the ibotenic acid that's remaining into muscozone. So you, then in, in the in the sun tea, you'd have muscozone, ibotenic acid, and muscomol. So you've got yeah, three exactly. of the compounds. Yeah, because because mus muscozone is the one that's the least talked about, or the or the what? If I looked up the research, and it see at the moment they're not focusing on that. But back to if people are thinking, well, what's the use of this? There's a study out in 2022 about anti-inflammatory properties of muscomol, and it's really interesting because it was um, it can um, help when nitric oxide. Um, when you've got too much of that in your mitochondria it's not a bad thing but all it does is it blocks up the electron transport chain so if you could take this it's going to move the nitric oxide out of the way so the mitochondria function again because when there's too much nitric oxide build up it like triggers an inflammatory pathway but there's also another inflammatory pathway called nf kappa beta so people don't need to know this but what they found was in the experiment they did they deliberately um, were working with mice and they wanted to produce a lot of endotoxin in the mice's gut as in for, for humans we can get problems with too much l LPS or lipopolysaccharide and they found that the muscomol from this mushroom that the mushroom was actually quoted was able to halt this inflammatory cascade um, in, in its path and it, they think it's happening at the nitric oxide level and the um, NF kappa beta level so that's really interesting medicinally I think. As well, it, and I'm right in thinking there's not many other compounds that we have access to these days, even in, 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 in big pharmaceutical industries that, that have got access to the stopping the cascade at the nitric oxide level then? Yes. Well, the thing is, the only other thing that um, can boot nitric oxide out of the electron transport chain is infrared or red light or going out in the sun. But it's one of these things, if um, everybody could do that, they would. And some people can't afford really expensive red light panels and other people are housebound. So when it comes wow. to... You know, I don't know of anything any uh, off the top of my head of, uh, other than infrared or red light that can um, get the nitric oxide to move out of the way in the mitochondria. Yeah, no medicines. No, definitely. No, there are no medicines. I mean, with anti-inflammatory agents, I mean, when you look at things like, you know, aspirin is the prostaglandin pathway and then they it works a lot with LOX and COX, COX with an X, not with a CK. So we're talking about something higher up because it's like a big cascade, like a yeah. hierarchy. And um, I've always found that... Um, the most unexpected things turn out to be the most useful. So that's another reason to protect the mushroom is because I think it's going to have quite potent anti-inflammatory properties. Yeah, but but we're, not, people... we're not even talking about... Sorry, carry on. Yeah, carry on. So we're not even talking about stopping inflammation in any way that we are currently doing at the moment. It's, yeah, it's, it's different, stopping yes. it effectively at, at the root source, at the, at, the, at the mitochondria level. Yes, yes. But that's, that that's all back to... Um, evolution because as we lots of people think humans and mushrooms the psychedelic ones evolved together and a mitochondria for people that don't know is like a relic of a bacteria so yeah. which makes energy in our cells as, along with exclusion zone water so it's basically the battery in our cell so it does make sense that all three of us all um evolved um together as in the mitochondria live in us and humans evolved with all these different mushrooms so yeah, um yeah. So, again, when it comes to poisoning yourself, I'd rather take my chances with a plant that I, that might it's been we've worked with for a million years than some weird new compound that's only been invented in the last 20 years anyway. So, you know, it's each to their own. I think because these look menacing or frightening, people haven't realised the benefits. Even I didn't know. I knew it was I thought it was a psychedelic mushroom only and it was used in. Um, traditional sort of um, Gnostic Christian ceremonies and people who've read the Immortality Key, that book, if you're interested in religion and psychedelic practices, that's a really good book to read. And The Mushroom got mentioned several times there. But again, I think you know more about the sort of psychedelic side because it's not psychedelic like psilocybin in any way, shape or form. It's very much sound distortion and probably time dilation and again, I think, you know, with all that, um, what do you call it? Um, oh, hang on. Someone's asking the name. It's um, a fly agaric. It's the it's the it's the, the spotty one. The, the, the red red mushroom. Mushroom. Yeah. The, these. Yeah. So. It's... Yeah. So basically, yeah, for anyone who wants to know, then with this mushroom, um, if there's any new ones, I dry them on a radiator. 
So basically, um, Ryan, if you just dry them on a radiator, you're not going to get the conversion rate from one of these molecules over to the other. They have to be held at about 70 degrees C um, until cracker dry to get about roughly a 30% conversion rate. And like me and Sarah are talking now, this information is all, it, one, it seems very hidden. Um, but two, it's, you know, there's very little studies on it. There's very actual, um, <clears throat> well, medicinal, well, anything, any medical studies on it really is there. Uh, one thing I have got access to, though, I've got access to a mass spectrometer, you know. So oh, really? What I might do, yeah. So what I might do is um, get some fly agaric, do different drying methods, and then put them through the mass spectrometer and see what, uh, basically, it ratios of ibotenic acid, muscozole, muscozone, or whatever is in it. Oh, right. Yeah, you could do. Um, I think um, chromatography is better for that, you know, um, uh, because it's sort of you're just looking for ratios. With, with mass spec, you've got to get it super clean with all the salts and solvents out. But um, this is important because actually isn't most of the uh, um, active compounds underneath the, the skin in the top of the mushroom? Is that yeah, is that so, where it is? So they think, yeah. So um, if you if you peel back the red bit, there's a yellow lining underneath um that apparently is where uh these compounds are, are. do you want me to but do it then... now because i think i've got that many so i think you can have a look to see that if people are going to dry them they don't need the the stalk do they or you but know i come across, be... across conflicting information on this you see because people in theory then you could just eat amony of stalks and nothing would happen to you i think the toxins yeah. um, well, I think that the, the molecules are all the way through the mushroom, but I think the highest concentrations are in the cap, in the skin, yeah. in the cap, particularly. Because I, I took all my caps off, all my stalks off when I was drying them, and I was looking at them in the basket thinking, I wonder if I'm just wasting the stems. So when I started to look into it, I saw references to using the stems, and I saw references to not using the stems as well. Yeah, I, the thing is, whenever I make a prep of something, whether it's a plant, and you probably do the same, I always separate the roots and the leaves. So I would, I, if when I dry all of mine up, I'm going to separate the caps and the the, the stalks because I think there's definitely something, it, you know, I never throw stuff away because there'll be, you know, some in there. And, and, and sometimes if you want to try something new, less is, is safer. Definitely, yeah. But, yeah, so effectively the process that you... That, now, so so, but just going back then, because the whole one of the whole main reasons for this live is to 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 get down to the nitty gritty of the safety of mm -hmm. all the potential uh, harmful effects of the compounds within this mushroom. Have you seen anything that so so neurotoxin, unless it's directed injected directly into the brain, or you're taking it in massive amounts, like giving a rat a human sized dose, you're not mm -hmm. thinking that it's going to cause any any lesions on the brain or anything like that? Because that's the biggest scaremongering tactic people use against this mushroom it's a neurotoxin um it, it is but i think you know because it's got the muscozone in it that's like speeds everything up like going through your body i think if you try to eat a large amount you'd either be sick first or you'd poo them out before you could absorb because it's basically it's a, i don't know how many i think isn't it the the dosages when people are taking them isn't it something like a small dose is one to five grams of a dry of dry and i don't know how when i dry this down um is it the same as other mushrooms you lose about um is 10 10 times less um to the wet yeah so that they go very light when they're dry but um, it'll be about maybe 15 grams. So when you start preparing the tea, you use 15, 15 grams of um, dried mushroom. And that'll make about roughly about 500 milliliters of tea and uh, potentially um, a dose. Of, well, a, a, yeah, like a micro dose of it is a teaspoon. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think that's the, the thing that, f first of all, that because obviously it's used in lab as labs as a neurotoxin, that can scare people. Um yeah. But like we were saying, first of all, it's in hu in very large doses, directly injected into the brain. And also there's there's that famous study about when you know, they, they fed rats lots of potatoes and the rats got really ill. So that's an example of just massively, you know, it's a massive amount of something in a very small animal. But we're not saying, you know, it's completely sort of free of problems. It, it's back to what um, Cam's saying. It's really how you prepare it is 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 vital 
Yeah, and, and, and I think I, I, th I think if you ate it raw, you, you wouldn't get you wouldn't hurt yourself. It wouldn't be pleasant, but you wouldn't get the benefits. And you'd probably think, what was all the fuss about? Unless you drank your own piss, because that's the only way that you're going to convert naturally into muscamol. But yeah. we don't you know what you're saying is that, you know, I, I've got like a, a pad here that I like a heat pad. That's probably at like 30 degrees. I can start drying them there. But fundamentally, I need to get it up to about 60 or 75 degrees. I think somebody in the last live said they use an air, an air fryer to, yeah. to dry theirs. Yeah, yeah. So anything that can hold it at that temperature, like um, I did mine in the oven. So it's got a hundred. They're always setting on my ovens of hundred degrees, and I left the door open, and then right. left a thermostat on the on on the tray. And obviously, mm -hmm. when the heat's blowing through, it's blowing through at I don't know seventy degrees or so. Um, so just the heat blowing over them did that. Um, yeah, wild forager, um, fifty to sixty degrees, you won't have a a, a decent enough conversion at that bit from everything that I've read so far. But yeah, yeah, someone's um, saying you can get a dehydrator for thirty-five um, pounds on Amazon. You can, but it doesn't go high enough. I've looked at it. I think the highest you can get is about sixty-five degrees. Because you need the heat and the lack of moisture. You you know you need to basically well, must, um, warm it up and dry it out. Yeah, yeah, because it's the if I'm, if I'm right in thinking the moisture acts as um, some kind of a like an intermediary. Uh, and the moisture basically allows one to go over to the other. You need the moisture at the same time. So I don't think you can just have dry caps and like fry dry caps and then convert them that way. I know one method of completely decarboxylating them um, is basically repeatedly boiling them till the water goes clear. So if you put muscaria in a pan and you boil them, the water will start to turn red. You take it out, put more water in, boil it again. It'll go a lighter colour, like a pinkish, take it out boil it again because you can actually eat them with no um and no effects at all because you can break down all these compounds in there um, oh so what French. basically so you deliberately boil them over and over and over and it just becomes yeah. like an ordinary edible mushroom yeah yeah the french eat a mushroom called the caesar mushroom it's it's it looks identical to an amanita but it's yellow um and that's not um as far as i'm aware that's got no ibotenic acid or muscomol in it um, but the French basically eat a very similar mushroom to basically have the same thing. But you can do it with the muscaria as well if you if you basically process all of the. Because basically, if too much heat for too long, you start getting the 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 compounds peak and then start to drop off. Yeah. Yeah. And not enough heat for long enough, you'll just it's get not... a, a small conversion. But then not enough, you'll have too much ibotenic acid and then um, not enough muscomol. And like you say, you want the two compounds in a relatively balanced state. I mean, I don't know, you might want 40% of one, 60% of the other. Um, if you want to go a bit more trippy, you might want 60% of one and 40% of the other. But I'm more interested in the nootropic side of it more than anything. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's why, um, you know, the, the muscarin on its own, as long as there's not too much, because if you have too much acetylcholine, that's not good either for memory. So people who are interested in nootropics, there are obviously smart drugs out there that work on the cholinergic system, like obviously alpha GPC and then things like paracetam and stuff stop the acetylcholine being break, broken down. Whereas what where, what the mushroom's got, it's got a molecule that looks exactly like acetylcholine that can fit into the receptor. So it, it, exactly, it's like a, a another form of, of having a nootropic. But the problem is like anything, too much and you can get sort of really sick dry dry all sorts of side effects so again yeah. it's all um you know if you over if you abuse this it's not going to be very nice and i think what's exciting about it is new as a nootropic it's got the the gaba receptors like the AMPA and the nmda and you've got two actually it binds to gaba c receptors as well so you've got the natural balance because you want gaba and glutamate you know neither's better than the other it's to do with a balance so that's where i'm interested Interested. So, so, so again, I probably get think like micro. A... Hmm? Sorry, carry sorry. On. No, you carry on. So, so would you get like um, a nootropic kind of? Because uh, I've heard people talking about the the nootropic side of it, saying that they can see multiple different uh, problems at the same time and and try to solve them at the same time, and it's, it's they basically just say it's like the limitless pill, right? Yeah. Um, but but then 
but the GABA effect of the muscle mall have a calming effect as well, so you'd be quite chilled and like zoned in. Because I'm thinking more like flow state, you know, like deep work yes, kind yes. of sit down and get shit done on this muscle. Yeah, because you need you, you need both because it's like you know if you're too wired, you can't concentrate because your brain's everywhere. But if you're if you've yeah, got too is... much GABA, you're just too you know it's like it's like having too much alcohol or too much Valium. You're just too drowsy so i think it's like um that's where i think the potential is it's with micro dosing so it's back to people may want it for a shamanic kind of psychedelic experience but i'm more interested in it now for the nootropic experience and that's where you know you just play with tiny tiny doses because you're not looking to have the weird sort of time distortion and the repetitive no. movements because the re i think the reason you get the repetitive movements with it is it activates receptors in the cerebellum uh, and that part of the brain, you know, it's um, involved in um, kind of uh, learning. So it can go berserk and it makes you repeat over and over and over. But that would be like a really high dose. I mean, yeah. you're more familiar All with the doses up. because um, where I'm talking about the one to five grams or, or maybe even less of dried mushroom, whereas that's a low dose, whereas I don't know what the highest safe dose for people who wanted a more sort of... <laughs> 30 grams is uh, where I've heard people um, having really, really bad experiences on 30 grams of the mushroom. Like stuck in like time loops and, and, and being stuck in the same spot and, and yeah. uh, dissociating yourself from reality. You don't believe that, you know, um, basically there's... If, if, if you just go on uh, trip reports of Amanita muscaria, people tell you what dose they took and what they experienced. And some of the trip reports on this, mush on this mushroom are insane like people talking about they could see they could see space and time like the, 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 you're saying that he was he was stood there and he's, he's, he's the astro projected outside his own body could see himself and he could see the space time continuum and he could see both the future the past and the present and was convinced that uh, his, his existence was nothing he was just a speck and i'm like well it's, it's not wrong but <laughs> yeah Sometimes it's, it's nice think. to actually see it, you know, in context. But well, yeah, definitely like the, whole, the whole thing about the repetitive, somebody said it's a bit like um, uh, like Groundhog Day, but sort of over yeah. 10 minutes. But but the thing is, in, in a way, it's, it's sort of um, kind of would be quite funny if, if it was if you weren't repeating something horrible. Exactly. Yeah. And if you got stuck in, in something that you really didn't like. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, like banging your head on the wall or that guy throwing himself off that log. You know, yeah. it's not going to be good. Definitely not. Yeah, somebody um, asked like me a question. Yeah, sorry. sorry. So, so somebody asked a question about these, uh, saying, are there any relatives that are not as potent? Because the panther cap's probably stronger than this. And then the yellow yeah. one you were talking about in France, that's a, a, a version of this that doesn't have, it may have a tiny bit of, you know, psychoactive effects. We don't know because we'll have to look it up. But is there anything in between this that's a bit, you know, easier? Nothing, or, or nothing, is this nothing that, nothing that I know of that contains the same range of compounds? Yeah. Like the muscari, it, it, the panther cap is about uh, ten times more potent, roughly, than the muscaria, which is probably why it's labelled as deadly or one of the deadliest mushrooms, even though it doesn't contain amatoxin. Because the panther cap's lumped in with like the destroying angel and the death cap even though it yeah. doesn't have amatoxin because it's in the Amanita family. So it yeah, might yeah, just exactly, be like, yeah. like the, the, the 10 times the potency. If you went, if you went, I mean, if you went a full flyer garrick, you're not going to have a good time. And if you went a full panther cap, then <laughs> you're really not going to have a good time. Oh yeah, no, it's horrible. Um, yeah, I've no, I've heard stories about. I think um, I can't just, I can't remember what Terence McKenna's brother's name is. Uh, he's still alive. I'm stupid, but what's his name? You might know. No, no, I'll remember as soon as this is finished because he was on Joe Rogan talking about when he had an experience with a panther cap and he just said yeah. it was ter it was actually quite alarming because he had uh, auditory hallucinations. Um, but that's a whole other level of it because the thing is that when people start chasing those kind of experiences, that's when it can go wrong. And like we were saying right at the beginning of the live, this mushroom has got like a very powerful anti-inflammatory effect really high up in the anti-inflammatory cascade. And it's got a potential to be really good for, for anxiety and sleep. So it's important to sort of protect it. <laughs>